Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of Unit 4. So we're still continuing our focus on quadratics, and those are little x squareds in our problems, okay? But now we're going to take a look at what they look like uh, graphically. So this whole unit is going to focus on the graph of our parabola. So be prepared to do lots of graphing over the next few weeks. So we're going to take a look at quadratic equations, graphing, starting with our first method today. Okay, um, we have graphed so far this year lines, linear equations, lines with shading when we threw in an inequality, and V shapes when we did those absolute value functions. So now it's time for that U shaped graph that you looked at last year, the parabola. Okay, in Algebra 1, maybe not last year, but in Algebra 1 you did it. So looking at that U shaped, that parabola graph, okay? So the very first thing you need to get now for your notes is that we're going to take a look or we're going to start with quadratic equations in standard form. So this is the way you probably remember most from Algebra 1. We're going to take a look at how to graph them when they're written in the form y equals, there's the ax squared, there's the bx, and there's the c. So similar to what we've been factoring and using the quadratic formula to solve, he looks that same way. Remember that y could be an f of x. It could have an f and an x there. That's our function notation. It still represents y, okay? So when we take a look at this, this is in standard form, and these equations will always graph into a U shape called a parabola. Very important that you know that term. So there are some key features of a parabola that you should write down. Um, just sketch yourself a general parabola like you see here. It doesn't have to be at these exact points, but a little sketch of a parabola will do. There are some key features that we're going to be identifying and looking at over the next few weeks. The first key feature is what's called the vertex. Just like the absolute value graph, it's right there, the bottom of that parabola, okay? We're going to be looking for that point quite often. And parabolas will sometimes have x-intercepts. Sometimes we're going to call them roots or zeros, okay? So those little guys right there, the x-intercepts, play a very important role in what's happening for us. We are also going to be drawing in or thinking about labeling a line called the axis of symmetry. That's the line that we could fold the parabola in half on, okay? So the fold line that would make that one side flip over onto the other side. That axis of symmetry we're also going to look at quite often. So these are three key things that we want to be thinking about or be able to identify rather quickly on a parabola. And now we're going to take some time to just do two examples today. They're quite long because there's some new notation, there's some new things that we're looking for. You're going to want to pause your work right now and maybe set up a little table, write the equation there up on the top. Um, make sure that you have a little grid space to actually graph your parabola. So maybe take some time right now to pause and set up your page so that you can fit all of these things near each other. All of those little words at the bottom of the slide here you see are all things that we're going to use to describe the parabola or what's happening on our parabola. Okay, so go ahead and take a minute here and pause. All right, so we're going to take a look at graphing a parabola written in standard form. Your first example here is y equals x squared minus 4x minus 5. To graph a parabola in standard form, we rely on a table. So you're going to need to make a table. Next to the table here, you see that I've written negative b over 2a. This is how you find the middle x value that needs to go in your table, or the x value of the vertex, because that vertex will ensure that we see both sides of our parabola. Remember, they're like the V shape, the absolute value function, where you need to be sure that you find that vertex so you can see both sides. Negative b over 2a is a little formula we use to figure out what x value needs to be in the middle of my table right there. So remember, looking at our work up here, b is negative 4, the a is 1. So if I negative a negative 4, it becomes 4 over 2 times 1. That's 4 over 2. So that would be 2. So the middle x value in my table needs to be the number 2. After that point, we're going to choose other x's around 2. So if I just go one less and one less and maybe one more and one more, these are the x numbers that we're going to plug into the equation. 
You notice I've added a middle column in my table. That's so I can show my work on how I'm plugging these numbers in so that you can kind of understand where I'm getting these values. So if we go ahead and take that x value of 0 and plug them into this equation, it would look like 0 squared minus 4 times 0 minus 5. And if you type that in a calculator or you calculate it mentally, that gives you a y value of negative 5. I would continue going on and do this all for all of these x values. So 1 squared minus 4 times 1 minus 5. If I type that in the calculator or calculate it in my head, that's negative 8. 2 squared minus 4 times 2 minus 5. And if I calculate that, negative 9. 3 squared minus 4 times 3 minus 5. And again, if I calculate that in my head or type it in a calculator, negative 8 is that y value. And last but not least, I think you already know what's going to happen because we need to have some symmetry here. But if I calculate this last one with 4 plugged into my equation, I end up with negative 5. Now I need to plot these points. So if my x is 0, my y is negative 5. So 0, negative 5 is my first point I want to draw on my graph. 1, negative 8 is another point I want to draw on my graph. 2, negative 9. 3, negative 8. And 4, negative 5. This is not a V shape because the slope on the arms is not constant, okay? It's a U shape. It's a little bit more curved. That is a picture of my parabola. Now, when we go to identify key features here, like you see on the bottom of the slide, we're going to be using the graph and also learning some new notation today. Now, we've done domain and range before. Domain is x values. Are there any limitations on x values that I could plug in here? No, not really. I could plug in whatever numbers I want. I just might not see the whole parabola, vertex, and all that. But I could plug in anything. So the domain is going to be all real numbers. Now, the range is a description of what the y values are doing or what the y's are doing. If I look at my table, I see that I go from negative 5 to negative 8 to negative 9, but back up to negative 8, back up to negative 5. And I also see on my graph that the lowest y value is negative 9. So this is telling me that my y values are greater than or equal to negative 9. Now let's talk about the vertex. The vertex is this point at the bottom right here of this parabola. So what point is that? That's 2, negative 9. Where is the axis of symmetry? The axis of symmetry is where you would fold this parabola in half. I would fold him in half right here along this line, right through that vertex right there. And then one side of the parabola would match up with the other. That is folding along the line where x equals 2. Not just the number 2, you have to say where x equals 2. We could fold the parabola the other way on the 2, but that really wouldn't be a good axis of symmetry. Okay, now is there a minimum or a maximum value? That's asking you, does, does this parabola have a high point or a low point? This parabola has a low point. He's like a valley. So he has a minimum value. How low does he go? He goes all the way down to where y equals negative 9. And last but not least is something called notations, interval notations, okay? So increasing and decreasing intervals. This is new for us. I think you can identify what parts of the graph are increasing and decreasing, but writing it in interval notation is new. Increasing and decreasing parts of the graph would be if you were to drive a little car from left to right. So if I'm here in my little car, and if I were going to drive him on this part of the graph, he would be going down to here, right? So that's the decreasing part of the graph, decreasing. And then at the bottom, my car would go back up. This is the increasing part of my graph. Now, when we go to write the intervals, we're going to write them in terms of what x values represent the portions of the graph that are increasing or decreasing. So the portion of the graph that's decreasing would be all of this side of the graph over here, all the way up to this spot, because these are, this represents the turnaround point. The 2 represents the turnaround point where my graph starts coming back up. So 
my decreasing interval would be from negative infinity, your first time writing the infinity sign, negative infinity, all the way to the x value of 2. See, negative infinity, like way past negative 9 there, if I kept going on the left, all the way to 2. That would be my decreasing part of the graph. Now I'm going to stick some parentheses around it. It's not a point. It's describing an interval in what's called interval notation. In higher level math classes, you see this quite often, as well as on AT ACT tests. Increasing interval would be from 2 all the way over to positive infinity, so the other part of the graph. So from 2 to positive infinity. That would be the portion of the graph that's increasing. The interval notation is new. I know it'll be a little confusing at first, but we'll get used to it as the year goes on. Let's take a look at another example, graphing number two. New parabola here. So again, I'm going to use negative b over 2a to figure out what x value goes in that middle part of my table. So again, I'm going to take negative 2, but negative and negative 2 is positive 2, over 2 times the a. That's negative 1, so this would be 2 over negative 2. Negative 1 is the middle value of my table. Then I'll choose x values on either side and go ahead and plug them in to my equation. Now my equation starts with a negative, and then if I plug in a negative 3, I want to capture him in parentheses. 2, negative 3, plus 8. And be careful here. This negative here times this negative here does not make a positive. The first thing you would do is square and then multiply by the negative on the outside. So some people prefer, and some of you I'm sure are already typing this all in your calculator, this value works out to be 5. I'll do the same thing with negative 2. Place him in parentheses and be careful when I calculate. This gives me a value of 8. Negative, negative 1 squared, 2, negative 1 plus 8. This gives me a value of 9. Negative 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus 8 gives me a value of 8. And I think you already see what should happen here when I plug in the 1. We should get 5. So once again, we'll go ahead to our graph and make a picture of this parabola. Negative 3, 5. Negative 2, 8. Negative 1, 9. 0, 8. 1, 5. All right, this parabola is upside down. If you remember graphing the absolute value graphs, you'll remember why he's upside down. It has everything to do with how this beautiful little function starts, okay? So let's take a look at some of the key features. The domain, again, will be all reals. I could plug in anything I wanted. The range is a description of the y values. The y values here go all the way up to 9, but then they come back down. So y is less than or equal to 9. The vertex on my graph here happens to be negative 1, 9. The axis of symmetry, where I would I fold him in half? Right here, through that vertex. That would be on the line where x equals negative 1. Does it have a minimum or a maximum value here? This one has a maximum because he's got a high spot on the graph. He tops out. How high does he go? Well, where y is 9. And now once again, let's look at our increasing and decreasing intervals, the x values for which the function is increasing or decreasing. So if I were going to think about the increasing, the little car now again, I like to think about a car starting on the left side of my graph. If my little car's right here, he'd have to go up the graph. So this is the increasing side. And then this is the decreasing side. And it's all about the x values. So if I go ahead and take a look at how that works here with x values, let me get another color, it'd be increasing from negative infinity all the way to negative 1. And then from negative 1 all the way to positive infinity, it'd be decreasing. So if I go to write my notation here, increasing from negative infinity to negative 1 captured in parentheses there, decreasing interval from negative 1 to positive infinity. 
Okay, interval notation to describe the increasing part of the graph and the decreasing part of the graph. Okay, thank you very much for your attention, and we'll practice some more later.